Hey, beloved, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. For the past several sessions, we have been working through, systematically working through, various claims that have been made by different pre-tribulational teachers, wherein they've claimed to found various pre-tribulational statements throughout the writings of the early and the ancient post-apostolic church. So those who came after the apostles in the early church, these guys claim they found all sorts of evidences of a pre-tribulational rapture, and we've systematically gone through and shown that not a single one of them is valid. There is not a single example of a pre-tribulational rapture taught anywhere in the early church, not before 1830 not before John Nelson Darby. So we've looked at some of the claims made by Ken Johnson, by Mike Golay of Behold Israel Ministries, as well as a man named Lee Brainerd, who gave a big presentation just a couple years ago at the Pre-Tribulational Research Center. And we've shown that despite all of their claims, not a single one of them is valid. In fact, in some cases, specifically uh, with regard to Mr. Brainerd, um, there's actually been some pretty transparent, dishonest editing um, of quotations, sort of manipulating material and this sort of thing, and it's really unfortunate. Um, now, to be very, very clear, I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with sort of um, confrontation, and especially when you start naming names, I get it, and then especially when you start saying things like deceptive, dishonest, and this type of thing. Now, I want to be very clear. Let me just uh, say this before we jump in. I know I can be a little bit of a punchy guy, kind of confrontational in this type of thing. Some of it's just my personality. Some of it's that I'm from Boston. Nobody really likes confrontation. Like most people hate confrontation. Uh, but here's the thing, right? The Bible commands us, the New Testament, the Lord himself commands us, especially as teachers, to test all things, to be Bereans, to double check people's claims, right? So... I know some of you are just your personality doesn't like confrontation or your culture. Maybe you're from California and you're just like, bad vibes, man. No, I'm just kidding. But like, you don't like confrontation. I get that. But the Bible commands us to do these things. Like, there's a lot of things I don't like the Bible commands us to do. I don't like dying to self daily. The Bible commands us to. We have to. It's not, an, it's not a question. Okay, so when various false claims are made by different individuals... They should be tested, and when they've been shown to be fraudulent, they should be exposed as fraudulent. Now, I've invited all of these guys graciously to have a public discussion. Let's have a public debate about these things, and unfortunately, not a single one of them is willing to do so. Now, there's a saying that says you can either be honest and ignorant, honest and uninformed, but once you've been informed, you can either be one or the other. Either you can be ignorant or uninformed. You can't be both. And so with each one of these guys, I've reached out and I've said, hey, like you're presenting information that is easy to prove is wrong, it's false, it's twisted, it's, you know, this sort of thing. Would you be willing to discuss this in public? Why are they afraid to allow their work to be, to be uh, analyzed in the light of day by the body of Christ? Like what, what, what is that? Why would someone be afraid of that? Let's have a public discussion. Let's have a public debate. You lay out your case. I lay out my case, and then the body of Christ does their job, and they make their own mind up. They make their decision. They are Bereans. This is the way it should work. We are accountable to the body. But unfortunately, in some of these cases, I reached out. And I, again, as I said, I can be a punchy guy, but I'm also, I think, really generous and gracious and understanding. I'm not pharisaical. I'm not hypercritical. But I am honest and maybe a little blunt at times. But when you reach out and then they go, no, I won't debate you and then they block you, I go, oh, okay, you're hiding something. You're not honest. So it's, uh, it's been very disheartening, I'll be honest with you, um, to see some of the dishonesty employed by pre-tribulational teachers, and we're unfortunately going to see a lot more of it um, this week and next week and possibly the week after that, depending on how long it takes. So what we're going to do today is we're going to jump in now, uh, last week we looked at, we critically analyzed this particular book. This book is um, written by a man named William C. Watson. He just passed away recently. I want to be very clear. My critical assessment of his work in no way, shape, or form is it intended to be 
personal. It's not. Again, we're just being obedient to what the Bible commands us to do. Okay, this is the way it works in academia. So this book, Dispensationalism Before Darby, up until literally a week ago, just a week ago when I got this brand new book, up until a week ago, this was the only effort out there, the only effort that existed um, to argue that the pre-tribulational rapture was taught before John Nelson Darby. This is the only effort to do so in a more academic, scholarly manner. Okay, this was sort of like the granddaddy, big mama of academic efforts to try to say that dispensationalism, specifically the pre-tribulational dispensational, uh, dispensationalism was taught before Darby. And as we saw, of the six individuals that Watson claims taught a pre-tribulational rapture, none of them actually do. And in fact, he actually admits it with a few of them himself and then on a few of the others. They're just fringe weirdos with strange, crazy eschatology, bizarre views of the last days. Not someone that you would want to claim and say, yeah, see, this guy agrees with us. You're like, wait, so you believe in six comings of Jesus? Yeah, I don't think that we should claim you as being on our team, this type of thing, right? So now in this session, we're going to look at some more of William C. Watson's uh, scholarship, but we're going to do so with regard to the stuff that he has um, contributed in this book. Now, this book just came out. I literally just got it this week, at last week. I got it last week. It's called Discovering Dispensationalism. It's edited by Corey Marsh and James Fazio. Now, let me just say something before I jump in. I'm going to really critique some of the stuff that's in this book, but I want to be very clear. The book is comprised of various contributions. Each chapter is a different contributor, and some of it is excellent. Some of the material in this book, the bit that I've written, I haven't read the whole book yet. I've written, I've read quite a bit of it. Uh, it's excellent. I actually recommend it. I think it's an important contribution if you're a theology geek to understand the historical veracity and legitimacy of many of the ideas that are very sacred and foundational to dispensationalism. The book overall is good, but chapter 5, which is William C. Watson's contribution, again, the author of Dispensationalism Before Darby, um, in that chapter he makes several new claims of pre-tribulationism taught in the writings of some of the early church fathers. He specifically starts after the 4th century. And as we'll see, um, with every single one of the claims that he makes, not a single one of them is valid. In fact, some of them are like really embarrassing, like bizarre. Like you go, how in the world did you even make this claim? So we're going to just jump in again. I'm not sure how far we'll get um, in working through some of these different uh, texts or claims, but there are several. So I think in this session, we're going to focus on um, Caesarius of Arles and another guy named Aspringius. Um, of, he's from a place called B-E-J-A, so I'm not sure if it's Beja or I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. I'm just going to say Aspringius. So today we're going to focus specifically on Caesarius uh, of Arles. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and uh, Aspringius. Okay, the first one, though, before we jump in, is he does, of course, not surprisingly, make the claim that Pseudo-Ephraim uh, taught a pre-tribulational rapture. We spent a whole session debunking this. This is the claim that's been around for uh, well over 30 years now. It was first made by Grant Jeffrey, um, where he claimed to have you know, found this statement. As we've discussed, all Pseudo-Ephraim was saying, whether it's Ephraim or Pseudo-Ephraim, the only thing he was saying was, those that have already died, they've already been gathered to the Lord, and they won't see the tribulation. That's all he's saying. And you see statements validating this throughout his writings. In fact, the same exact statement, the exact same quote appears in another sermon, the title of which is called The Sermon on the Separation of the Soul and the Body. And throughout these, um, throughout that particular sermon and throughout these other sermons where the statement is found, he makes reference literally to people going to cemeteries and saying that the dead bodies, man, you guys are blessed because you escaped the tribulation. 
So we see multiple sort of validations of the fact that that's all he was saying. Easy, easy to misunderstand if you have confirmation bias. If you're like, pre-trib rapture, pre-trib rapture, and then you read the statement, you go, oh, you know, the saints have been gathered to the Lord before the tribulation, and they don't see it. And you go, oh, wow, that must be a pre-trib rapture. And then you go, no, actually, the context of whatever he's saying, everything else that he's saying is in the context of the saints that have already died, that have already been gathered by the angels when their body is separated from their souls. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching. If you don't already know it, let me tell you once again that the basis of our existence is Romans 15, 20, where Paul makes it clear that his driving force for mission in the world was to lay foundations for the gospel where there were none and to preach the gospel to those who'd never heard the name of Jesus. And if you would like to join us in that effort or find out more information about how you can connect with us in our pioneering initiatives in the 1040 window amongst people where there are no foundations, you can go to faistudios.org to find more information. Back to the teaching. So, um, despite all of the hurrah and hubbaloo that has surrounded this claim, Pseudo Ephraim is not a uh, valid example of a pre-tribulational rapture. Now let's go ahead and jump into Caesarius of Arles. So Watson claims that Caesarius taught a mid-trib or pre-tribulational pre rapture. Okay, so in fairness to Watson, he goes, he either taught pre-trib or mid-trib. That's his claim. Okay, Watson crosses the line from his normal sloppiness into what appears to be dishonesty. Again, I just want to say I'm not saying he's a liar. It really looks like it. It really appears to be dishonesty. I'm going to let you all decide. Um, he actually edits some of Arl's comments as well, Arl's, some of Caesarius's comments, Arl's is not his last name, uh, to falsely create the impression of pre-tribulationism. That's bad. Like when you pull a section out of a quote that dramatically affects its meaning, or at least affects its meaning to most people, that's, that's bad scholarship. It's one thing if some popular guy on the internet does it. It's another thing when you are writing a book like this, and you're trying to, you know, again, peer-reviewed, academic, that's dishonest. And in fact, it's really questionable the fact that it wasn't caught. Okay, I'm just going to say that within this this um, this level of uh, of scholarship. So Watson cites Arl's uh, exposition on the apocalypse, in other words, his commentary in the Book of Revelation, specifically homily eight, but he removes the most critical and pertinent sentence. So let's go ahead and look at. I've got a um, sort of a side by side comparison here. Um, first of all, of Watson. I'm going to read Watson's quote, and then we're going to look at the quote that he edits. So Watson quotes Caesarius. He says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. So again, Caesarius is quoting the book of Revelation. And they went up to heaven in a cloud. So that is the, the portion in the book of Revelation where the two witnesses are brought up to heaven. Now, if you read all of Caesarius's um, exposition on the book of Revelation, he believes the two witnesses are the church. They are symbolic. They represent the church. He says, the apostle spoke of this when he said, we shall be caught up in the clouds to meet Christ. Okay, so there's Caesarius. Now, again, Watson quotes him. Here's the part on the right in yellow that Watson cut. Here's the full quote. He says everything that we just read, but then Caesarius adds, it is written... What is written? He's talking about when the church shall be caught up in the clouds to meet Christ. It is written that this cannot happen to anyone before the coming of the Lord. The rapture cannot happen before the coming of the Lord. What is he referring to? He's referring to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul says the day of the Lord won't happen until two things happen first. The falling away, the revealing of the Antichrist and the falling away, the apostasy. And then he says, the, our gathering together and the coming of the Lord, he links them together. So Caesarius is simply commenting on Paul's letter. He goes, the rapture is not going to happen until the coming of the Lord, the second coming, the glorious coming, okay, his appearing. Now watch this. 
here's the next slide in which I include the next statement that Watson makes in place of the line that he cut. So instead of including the line, which changes everything, which clearly makes Caesarius a post-tribber, he cut that out and then he says this. He also implied a mid-tribulational rapture was to be expected, or pre-trib if one considers only the last three and a half years as the tribulation. So basically, Watson is saying that Caesarius believed the rapture would happen before the three and a half years. That's the claim that he makes. But he cut out the line that says this cannot happen to anyone before the coming of the Lord. Guys, again, I don't want to assume, again, never assume malice when incompetence is an option. Like when you're dealing with men, just assume they screwed up. Just assume they made a mistake. Don't assume they're deliberately dishonest. Don't assume that they are not being honest, uh, honest players here. But when you look at this, you go, it's hard for me to believe that he was being honest, that he was not trying to deliberately mislead his readers. That's my reading. Again, I could be wrong. I'm not judging him. I'm just saying it certainly seems that way. And I think I'm being fair. Elsewhere, Watson outright ignores, and this is the consistent pattern. They find a quote, they go, look, this guy was pre-trib, and I go, did you read the rest? Did you read the rest of Caesarius' commentary? And to be clear, these are pretty short commentaries in some of, the, some of these commentaries that we're looking at, um, whether we're looking at Victorinus or uh, Caesarius here, we're going to look at Andrew of Caesarea. Like these are relatively short. Like it doesn't take a lot of time to work through, especially the the pertinent sections of the Book of Revelation. And I go, how can you just say that you're a scholar, but only be aware of one comment, but not be aware of all of these other comments, which are clear, which are very very clear. So let's look at this. Here is a very long quote, but we're going to read all of it. This is from Homily six. He says, when he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. And then he goes on, Caesarius goes on to give his commentary. He goes, that is the last persecution. So here's Caesarius saying that at the sixth seal, at the sixth seal, there's a great earthquake. And he says that earthquake, what it represents, the earthquake is symbolic of the last persecution, which is another way of saying the great tribulation. So he has the church. And when he says persecution, he means against the church. Okay, so he has the church on the earth at least up until the sixth seal. Okay, that's unlike any pre-tribber today. That's nothing that any pre -tribber. In fact, this is basically, so far, like someone who today believes in the pre-wrath perspective. And then he goes on, he quotes, he says, And the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood, and the stars fell to the earth. And then he goes on and he explains what he believes that represents or what that means. He says, whether it is the sun and the moon or also the stars, the church is in view. So he says, the sun and the moon and the stars represent the church. And he says, although a part is understood from the whole. So he goes, part of the church is represented here. He goes, because it's not the whole church that falls from heaven. Rather, those who in the church are evil. So now he's pointing out, he's saying, part of the church will fall away during the tribulation. When he says, fall from heaven... He also elsewhere says heaven represents the church. He says the church is heaven. So if something falls from heaven, they are leaving the church. That's his interpretation. And then here he says, the text speaks of the whole, that's the whole church, since the last persecution will occur throughout the lands of the earth. So he says the whole world will be engulfed by the great tribulation. At that time, those who are righteous will remain firm in the church as though they were in heaven. However, those who are full of avarice, the unrighteous, and the adulterers will have consented to give sacrifice to the devil. Moreover, at that time, those who call themselves Christians but are only so in name will fall from heaven. That is, from the church. In other words, he goes, they're going to leave the church as though they were stars. And then he goes on. He quotes the book of Revelation again. As the fig tree sheds its fruit when shaken by a mighty wind. This is, if you remember a few sessions ago, Victorinus had the same interpretation when he sees the fig trees falling from the fig tree, the figs falling from the fig tree as untimely figs. Either they're not ripe enough or they're, they're past due. The point is they fall from the tree and they leave the church. And then he goes on, Caesarea says this, the church is compared with a tree shaken by the wind, for the strong wind refers to persecution. 
The fruit refers to evil people who will be cut off from or will leave the church. So guys, in the first quote, we've got Caesarius with the church facing the last great persecution on the earth and many of them apostatizing. You've got two sacred modern doctrines here being trampled on by the early church. One is the pre-tribulational rapture. He clearly didn't believe in it. He believed the church would be on the earth and endure the tribulation. They wouldn't be raptured before the tribulation. And second, he didn't believe in once saved, always saved. He believed that many people who call themselves Christians will leave the church. Here's homily seven. He says, after this, the sixth angel blew his trumpet. So now we're at the sixth trumpet. Okay, so you've got the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. We're now in the, we're in the sixth trumpet, toward the end of the trumpets. From this point on, the final preaching of the church begins. He still has the church on the earth preaching faithfully the gospel at the sixth trumpet. And I heard one of the four horns of the golden altar, that is the sight of, in the sight of God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. In the altar that is in the sight of God, we are to understand the church. Again, when he sees this altar in heaven, he says that is symbolic of the church. God's looking at the altar. The altar is the church. Again, he interprets the book of Revelation very symbolically, Okay, not through a more literal lens, which is how I would interpret it, but interestingly, he arrives at many correct conclusions. It's quite fascinating. Here's the important line. He says, in the time, now please hear this, in the time of the last persecution, this is at the sixth trumpet, she will dare to despise the words and commands of that most inhumane of kings and will separate from those who have submitted to him. So he's saying the church will stand up against the Antichrist at the sixth trumpet. And then he goes on, he says, the four angels were released. This indicates that the persecution had commenced. So the church is in the midst of the great persecution. How can Watson say, Caesarius was either mid-trib or pre-trib? Where in the world do you get that? They're on the earth during the sixth trumpet at least. Here again is in homily 6. He says, And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets made ready to sound the trumpets. This means that the church prepared herself for preaching, for trumpeting the truth. Again, that's at the end of the seals. Then here we are in homily 9. It says, The woman fled into the wilderness. We know this is in Revelation 12. He says, With good reason we understand the wilderness to be the world where to the end Christ guides and feeds the church. To the end, Christ will guide and feed the church throughout the world during the last great persecution. Guys, Caesarius of Arles was a post-tribber. He believed that the church would be on the earth to the end until the coming of the Lord, at the very least, right up until the sixth trumpet, okay? So he was like not even a pre-rather, like he's got the church being raptured at least um, closer to the end. I mean, actually, he says at the end. Okay, so that's um, pretty damning, pretty damning. Again, just for clarity, after looking at those, you got William Watson saying, he says, basically, Caesarius implied a mid-tribulational rapture was to be expected or pre-trib. How can you make that claim with a straight face? Okay, now we're going to look at a springius. Again, I'm just going to say Beha. Could be Beja. I have no idea. I'm not even sure. Um, where is it? If it's like Eastern Europe, I'm not sure. So this is his next alleged uh, pre-tribulational find. Again, Watson is seen to either be exceedingly, unfortunately, sloppy or dishonest. And I know this is strong language, guys, but it merits it. It genuinely merits it. I'm not a scholar. It didn't take me 15 minutes to go, what in the world is this guy even saying? You know, Watson seems to have only done a very cursory reading, specifically of Aspringius' comments on Revelation 3, chapter, 10, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. This is pretty much every pre-tribber's go-to passage. We've already worked through it. We've shown that it in no way, shape, or form teaches a pre-tribulational rapture. But he turns there, 
and follow his logic. Follow Watson's logic because I, I can't even track with his logic. Like, I'm convinced that he doesn't have very solid comprehension skills. And the reason I say that is because he'll read someone who's clearly in one particular theological category, and he'll put him in another category, and I go, is he just, like, he? I, I go, he has to just not understand what he's reading. Okay, so here's his comment regarding Aspringius. Watson says, in his commentary on Revelation, he, again, that's Aspringius, anticipated a period when the church will be removed prior to a period of testing upon the earth. Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to faistudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. So he says the church will be removed before, prior to the tribulation, prior to the testing. And he goes on, he says, John is speaking not only of his own times, but also future ages. The book of Revelation. So he's quoting Aspringius. Moreover, he promises that God will preserve his church in the last times. He says, preserve. He quotes Aspringius, who says that God will preserve his church in the last times. When the demon, this is a very common term in many of the writings of the early church fathers, they call the Antichrist the demon. He says, the enemy of the human race will come to tempt those who live on the earth. It is worth point out, it's, it's just a little uh, typo, he says, it is worth pointing out uh, that according to Aspringia, so here's again Watson's comments, God will preserve his church from the enemy of the human race. In contradistinction to those who live on the earth, namely a different class of people who are tempted by the Antichrist. The clear implication is that his church will not be here on the earth during this horrific period. So he says the clear. Now, again, I joked last week. I said Watson loves to use the word clear. Whenever something is not clear, he says the word clear, as if that's going to convince us. But again, we have our own ability to critically analyze things. We have our own faculties. We can look at this and go... This is not clear. Don't tell me it's clear, because it's not clear. All Zespringia said is that God will preserve his church while the peoples of the earth are being tempted. And then he goes on, he says, well, clearly those are a different class. Like, it's just this very convoluted, uh, very involved argument. But is it reasonable? Is it rational? Okay. Beyond making transparently poor arguments, and again, they're bizarre arguments, Watson also selectively ignores other very clear, once again, very clear post-tribulational statements in the writings of Aspringius, including once again, the very line that immediately follows what he just quoted, the part that he cuts it out. He does it again. This is only the third individual that he's trying to prop up as a pre-tribber. We've only got to the third individual, and he's already deceptively, dishonestly editing his citations. Now, let's look at the full context. Once again, we've highlighted the portions in yellow that Watson cites and emboldened the portions that he ignores. So this is Aspringius's comments from chapters 3, verse 10 and 11. So first he quotes the verse and then he comments. So here's the part that Watson just quoted. Again, because you have kept the word of my patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that is coming upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That's Revelation 3, verse 10. Here's Aspringius' comments. Behold, he declares with the utmost clarity that he is speaking not only of his own times, but also future ages. Moreover, he promises that he will preserve his church in the last times when the demon, the enemy of the human race, will come to tempt those who live on the earth. I don't see any reason why his people are a different class of those who live on the earth. Now, yes, the book of Revelation uses the term earth dwellers, but that doesn't mean that Aspringius does. We cannot impose our particular perspectives onto someone. 
We have to take them at their word, at face value. But notice this. This is the part that Watson did not include. Now he begins commenting on verse 11. But before he does, he says this. Lest, okay, it's coming to tempt those who live on the earth. And he goes, the Lord will preserve his people. Lest they who live at that time be utterly confounded in that temptation. He goes, he's going to preserve his people so that the saints that are alive on the earth during that time, they won't succumb to the temptation. And then he says this, behold, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have. Let no one take your crown. You can't take a crown if someone doesn't have a crown. You have to have a crown in order for someone to lose their crown. He's not talking about sinners. He's talking about the church on the earth. He goes, don't let anyone take your crown. And then Springius continues. He says, he, for, he foretells the suddenness of that advent and the quick destruction of Satan in the future. Ready? Here's the kicker. Here's the, uh, the money quote. Moreover, he says that the future temptation will not be long. And for that reason, he, admo- he admonishes them that the enemy not seize their crown. Who is the temptation for? It's for the church. Aspringius says, Aspringius very clearly says that the church will be preserved during that time. And he says, hold firm, lest anyone take your crown. All you have to do is read in context the next two sentences. It's very clear that Aspringius did not believe, as Watson said, that the church would be removed before the temptation. He doesn't say that at all. Clearly, And it's fair to say clearly here because it's not confusing. Again, Watson also ignores others of Aspringius' comments. Here is chapter, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, and here's Aspringius' comments. He says, he, again, he's referring to John the Apostle, exhorts his church, or I'm sorry, that would be Jesus, not to fear those who can kill the body, but afterward have nothing which they can do. He goes on, he says, for just as in the early period of the Catholic Church, now, when he says Catholic Church, he's not talking about the Roman Catholic Church, he's just talking about the universal church. He means the early church, that's all he means. He says, for just in the early period of the Catholic Church, after the banishment of the apostle, whose sayings these are, okay, so now he's talking about the apostolic period, he says, the sufferings continued and many tribulations were inflicted on the church. So we know that also in the future, more sufferings will be inflicted when the Antichrist arrives. You couldn't get more clear than this. He goes, just like the early church suffered, so will the church suffer when the Antichrist arises. As it was during the apostolic period, so will it be in our period. We will also face the tribulation of the Antichrist. We will face the wrath of Satan. We will face the wrath of the unbelievers, but the Lord will preserve us. That's what, it says, that's what Aspringius says. That's what Aspringius taught. He did not teach a pre-tribulational rapture. And so finally, again, just to contrast uh, Watson's claims with what Aspringius actually said, Again, Aspringius anticipated a period when the church will be removed prior to a period of testing on the earth. The clear implication is that his church will not be on the earth. Here's what Aspringius actually said. Just as in the early period of the Catholic Church after the banishment of John the Apostle, whose sayings these are, the sufferings continued with many tribulations they were inflicted on the church So we know that also in the future, more sufferings will be inflicted when? When the Antichrist arrives. So guys, we've just, we've really worked through only three of the original claims made by William C. Watson in chapter five of this book. And we've shown that so far, not a single one of them has any validity. In fact, Watson, who is making these claims, again, very similar to Lee Brainerd, um, engages in arguably very dishonest, selective editing of key specific lines. And then he makes statements, which he says are clear. He makes these very emphatic statements that are easy to disprove, that are easy to disbunk. Okay, so in next week's session, we're going to continue. Um, There's quite a lot to look at with Andrew of Caesarea. There's a handful, um, some really fun stuff. So we've got at least one, maybe two more sessions working through this book. 
and debunking some of these bogus claims. So I hope um, this is all, um, I hope it's all relevant. Again, I know for many of you, this is only relevant if you've been hearing these things from some of your pre-tribulational friends. Again, they don't look it up. They don't check it. They just go, I read it, and therefore it's true because it supports my team. It supports what I believe, confirmation bias. Our job is to test all things. And so we've done so, and we've been faithful. So look forward to seeing you all next week, picking up from here. I do trust that you all are blessed. Until then, guys, stay faithful. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, and he will preserve us. He will get us to the finish line. So God bless you all, and Maranatha.